chapter 3 and chapter 4, beginning at verse 13 on chapter 3. It said, Your words have been harsh against me, says the Lord, yet you say, What have we spoken against you? And you have said, It is useless to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked as mourners before the Lord of hosts? So now we call the proud blessed, for those who do wickedness are raised up. They even tempt God and go free. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I, I make them my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be, will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. That will leave them neither root nor branch. But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise, and healing in his wings. And you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. Yet shall, you shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts, remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Oreb for all Israel, with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children of their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Thank you. You may be seated. We have talked about in the book of Malachi the questions that Malachi has asked the people there. And he asked them, are you going, are you just going through the motions? Or And then another question was, do you honor your commitments? And will you return to me so that I can return to you? Then last week, I think, we, we spoke about how do you treat God. Well, today we're going to ask another question. As he finally asked the question in a sense, what is your decision. What is your decision? You see the people here were complaining very harshly to God because things weren't going their way. And I think that they were getting angry but they had failed to realize that they had, as I spoke a few weeks ago, they had turned away from God and things weren't going very well for them. And obviously when we turn away from God then things don't go too well for us, do they? It, you know, that they don't do that. I think that uh, when, we, when we don't obey Him, then things begin to happen in our lives that's not pleasing to us. And we wonder, God, what's going on here? But then we have to ask, to ask ourselves, remind ourselves, it's not God, but it's us. So they were, they were complaining harshly to Him. And uh, I think that uh, I was reading about a, a fictional story the other day, and it said this. It said, it was told about a management seminar about a young manager who was going to replace this uh, executive retiring executive. So the younger man approached him and asked him, Sir, I know the legend that you have become as a leader in this company. Could you give me some advice as I try to fill your shoes? The older man pondered the question and responded three words. Make good decisions. That's good advice, the young man replied as he wrote this down. And what is the key to making good decisions? One word, the veteran executive replied, Experience. And how do I get this? The eager young man asked as he scribbled experience on his paper. Two words. The retiring man answered, bad decisions. <laughs> True, isn't it? We learn to make good decisions because we make bad decisions. <laughs> so we're faced, every one of us today are faced with hundreds of decisions every day. Our biggest decision this morning when we got out of bed was, what are we going to have for breakfast? We had cereal or Pop-Tarts. We chose Pop-Tarts. Brown sugar and cinnamon. Okay. But we all, and we have decisions of what we're going to wear to church this morning. We make, and, and this morning, we're, we're making probably even decisions right now. Should I stay here and listen to this guy or should I go home? Well, the door's locked so it don't really matter. No, Greg's back there protecting. But what I'm saying is we make hundreds of decisions every day, and some of them we don't make right, do we? I'll, I'll be very honest with you. I made a lot of poor judgment calls, poor decisions in my life. 
And I've continued making, but because of those, then we learn to make good ones. So, but we want to always make the right choices, but we don't. This is what was happening here. And, and the reason we want to make the right decisions is because, you see, we are the sum of our decisions. We make decisions, and decisions make us. It's sort of like this. I, you know, sometimes you ever wonder why there's so many crabby old people in the world. <laughs> it's because they were crabby young people. That's a fact. They just didn't get that way. They were crabby young people. And a lot of times, oh, I'm going to get fired up in that one. Aren't I? But you know, there's no crabby people in here. But anyway, the thing about it is we, we make our decision and they make, make us. Mary Kay Ash, probably everybody's probably heard of Mary Kay, but anyway, she made this statement. She said, be careful of the choices you make today because they will become your lifestyle tomorrow. Simply put, isn't it? We make bad choices today and they become our lifestyle tomorrow. We see a lot of young people, especially young people, and we focus on that a lot of time, but we see even older people that have made poor decisions as they were young and, and it's affected their life. We see, we see people, you know, young people that are making decisions about drugs and different things today that's affected the rest of their lives. We see that. We see them in jails. We see them everywhere because they've made poor decisions. Well, here is what Malachi is saying to these people here. He said, listen, you have made poor decisions here. You've chosen not to serve me. You've treated me wrong. You've not honored your commitments. You're just going through the motions of things. And now you're complaining because of the fact of those decisions. So he's asking them. He said, now, I'm going to ask you to, for, to, to make decisions, he said. And, and that's what, basically what he's saying here. And I think as I look at this, and I, I begin to think of how that each day we face our choices regarding our walk with God. I'm glad they played that song, that just a closer walk with thee. And every day of our life, we make our decisions and our choices regarding our life, our everyday walk with God. Again, we can't even walk without Him holding our hand. But a lot of times, we choose not to let Him hold our hand as we're walking through life. Wow, we always get in trouble when that happens. We are in, we're trying to get our our puppy, Ginger, to, <laughs> when she goes, <laughs> it's puppy, that's what she answers to, I don't know why, but it's puppy, you call her Ginger all day, then you say puppy, you know? <laughs> but anyway, we'll go out in the yard, and, and we'll be working out there, so we'll let her loose out there, but every time somebody comes down our street walking, she barks and she goes out on the street, so we're trying to get her to realize, you know, and I go out there and I beat the daylights out of her. I'm just kidding. <laughs> and we're trying to get her to realize that when you make that choice to go out on that street, there could be a car popping around there any time, and it's, it's a hot dog. So, but we haven't got that yet, but we're trying, we're working. So any time that we get out of, out of the hand of God or when we get into a place that, that we think we can do it on our own, then things begin to happen in our lives. It's not good. And we pay for those. And that's what he's saying here. He said the decision time. So Malachi said, remember what I all, all told you throughout these verses, chapters, he said, but now it's time for you to make decisions about your walk with God. And it's time that we, as God's people, truly make the decisions we need to make with our walk with God. I was talking to Pastor Grace Baptist Church at West Liberty, where we're going to be going in a couple of weeks for our, our, our mission. And uh, he said, Tom, he called me and said, Brother, he said, I want you to know something. He said, I understand that, you know, you guys are coming down. And he said, I understand that you're supposed to be working with Habitat for Humanity. And uh, I said, yeah, we're supposed to be doing that. But then I found out in the meantime, there's another group from Chicago coming to uh, work with Habitat for Humanity. So we got bumped from one place to another to be staying. We'll be staying in a big farmhouse and all these things. And he said, you know, he said, would you mind if we switch what you're doing? He said, instead of going to Habitat for Humanity, would you care to help what we got in our community? There's a lady that's been skipped over uh, by Habitat for her house and all these things, but yet we want to help her do all these things. So we get to talking about that. And he said, you know, and he said, mission work is not just something, it's not a vacation, but it's a time that we learn to serve others. So I got to thinking about that, that he said we have to learn to make decisions about walking with our Lord 
So the first decision I think that Malachi gives us here, he gives us five areas of our life here that we need to focus on as he tried to get them to focus on. First of all, look at verse 13 again. Your words have been harsh against me, says the Lord, yet you say, what have we spoken against you? You have said it is useless to serve God. What profit is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked as mourners before the Lord of hosts? So now we call the proud blessed. For those who do wickedness are raised up. They even tempt God and go free. So they said, you know, they had said it's useless to serve God. Wow, can you imagine anybody saying that? He said it's useless to serve God. What profit is it that we keep God's laws, keep his ordinance? Does it do us any good? Wow. We've walked as mourners before the Lord of hosts. And we call the proud blessed. They just switch things around. <laughs> and for those who do wickedness are raised up. But so I look at that thing. The first thing that we need to realize and look at today, the area, first area that we need to look at is will we render service to others? Is it, what decision will you make when it comes time to render service to others? Wow. <laughs> I think that we have to ask ourselves. What do we do in order? What must we do in order to, to serve others? You know, folks, let me tell you something. We talk about serving God. And so many times people get the misunderstanding that we are here in this building today to serve God. No, we're here this morning to worship God. Our service begins out there. So we have to make a decision today. Will we Are we willing to serve God? What must we do in order to serve Him? Because when we're serving others... We are serving God. First thing we have to do is that we have to <laughs> we have to have our prejudices all removed from us of who we are going to serve, who we are going to help. Huh. Again, we talked about and we'll talk about love in our class today, and so many times it's easy for us to to love somebody who loves us, isn't it? It's very easy to do that. But how about those that don't give one hoot about you? We still learn to love those. We love them because God has loved us. And so we look at that when we begin to serve others, we must put aside our prejudices, whether whatever they be, whoever they be. We, we think, oh, I want to go serve those who are, you know, who are willing to help me and all these things. But how about those who are not even paying attention to you, not even caring or not whether you're helping you? He said to serve. How about that drug addict? Yeah, we're to serve. How about that, that drunkard? Yeah, we're to serve. How about that homeless person? We're to serve. Wow. But we have to put our prejudice aside and say, we're not going to pick and choose, Lord, but we're going to let you choose who we are going to serve. Not only do we need to put our prejudice aside and remove them, but we have to have our, our desire to serve God must be awakened. And I'll tell you what, if that song that said just a closer walk with you didn't do something to you, man, something's wrong with you. I, you know, I'm being very honest with you because, because when we sing that song, Lord, just a closer walk with thee, Lord, let, 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 me ha let it happen every day. But we have to realize that we've got to awaken our desire to serve God. We've got to awaken our desire to serve God. Yeah, even when we're in the middle, you know, of uh, things are going well for us. And then we say, well, but you know what? Things are going pretty good, God. I don't really need to get out and serve a lot because things are really happening here. But even when things are going good, when things are going bad, God awakened my desire to help somebody. Awakened my desire to be able to serve you. <laughs> Not only that, but I think our understanding must be enlightened of what it means to serve God. We may get up in the morning and have our daily have our Bible reading. We may get up in the morning and have our prayers. And we may walk up right throughout every, all every day and say, man, I'm really serving God today. And we may learn to do some church work and, and all these things. I'm really serving God today. But when it comes to serving God, we must realize and understand serving God means that we're going to be serving others. We're going to be serving others. And then we must also have our emotions. Our emotions must be aroused. Our emotions must be aroused. I had a Friday evening, I had the privilege of going fishing with my brother Mo. 
and uh, my next door neighbor, Angelo, is, uh, he had never been fishing before in his life, so I, I took him. Uh, I, actually, I took him a couple weeks ago to show him how it's done. <laughs> uh, white rookies. And uh, so... <laughs> And so I took him Friday, I'm on, and, and Angelo and I, so we were there. And uh, so when we got there, there was, some other, there was some other folks that were fishing at the same pond. And I knew them. So I pulled up and asked them how they were doing. Oh, man, I said, we're burning it up. I said, oh, man, this is good. This is going to be great. So I'm saying, we go to the other side of the lake, and we're fishing, not getting anything. Elmo finally caught one about like that. And, and so not doing much good. So these other people then said, hey, Tom, we're going to be leaving. You want these hot dogs? I said, sure I do. I'll bring them to you. I said, no, I'll tell you what. You just leave them where you are. Put them on that bench. I'll come over there. I said, you guys really burn it up. He said, yeah, we've got a total of one. I said, I really want to go over there. I said, I said to the guys, I said, guys, I'm going to the other side to get these hot dogs. And so I just started peeling off the skin of the hot dogs. And I just started putting it on the hook. And I was catching bluegills about like that. I caught some bass about like that. And next thing you know, it aroused the emotion of my brother and Angelo. Of course, then I butt dialed Anita. <laughs> she called me. I said, What can she want? I'm in the middle of fishing. <laughs> so I answered, I answered the phone. She said, You call me? I said, Uh oh, no. But anyway, so it, it aroused their emotion because they could see in that same spot those other folks were. I was, I, I, was, I was getting all kinds of fish. So here they come. Emma on one side and Angelo on the other side. So I'm still, I'm right in the middle of these guys. And Ammo every now and then would catch one. Angelo, he was having a big problem because he didn't know, really know what to do with it. And he, he would miss them every time. I just throw one out in two minutes, but I had another one. I probably caught about 40. So they were there. Of course, that's a fish tail, right? <laughs> I quit counting about 25, so who knows. But anyway, so their emotions were getting aroused. And all of a sudden, I pulled out a, a bass about like that. And then Angelo gets into it. He finally starts. So when I pull one out, if I bring mine back in, he throws in my spot. <laughs> right where I am. While I'm baiting. I said, no problem. So I go to the other side of him. I'll throw in. Guess what I do? I start catching fish. So he comes back over there. Elmo just said, it didn't bother me. <laughs> but what I'm saying, did Angelo start catching fish? And his emotions, but up to that point, up to that point, he was kind of blase and not really caring about anything. And then all of a sudden, his fish started hitting, and he started catching fish. His emotions were aroused, were aroused. Look at what I'm doing. I'm excited about this. So Elmo and I convinced him if he's going to fish with us again, he has to go first of all go buy a straw hat. He had a baseball cap. You can't fish in a baseball cap. It has to be a straw hat. And Elmo said, the second thing is you've got to go buy you a Chevrolet or a GMC truck. <laughs> And it has to be an extended cab. <laughs> and said, I've, been, look, I've, been, I've been wanting a truck. So anyway, well, anyway, when I, I said all that for this reason, that up to that point, we were not, you know, when we were fishing on the other side, we were not, or emotionally, we were not aroused by, by the fishing until we moved to the spot that we could start catching fish. And sometimes that's what it takes to serve others. That's what it takes to serve God. We have to have our emotions aroused. And sometimes that can only happen when God, when we listen to God and go where He wants us to go and do what He wants us to do. Then our emotions will be aroused. You've never really experienced the fact that unless you've experienced helping someone and serving others, you've never really experienced a lot of things until you tell somebody this hug you and says, Thank you so much. You don't know how much I needed that. Wow. Our emotions must be aroused. And then I think that not only our emotions must be aroused, but if we are to if we are to render service to others, we our obedience must be prompted. Our obedience must be prompted. <laughs> Again, we talked in our in our class. They won't let me teach in there anymore, probably. But no, they were they were great kids. But it's just like being parents. Sometimes we know we have to we have to make our children obey us at times. And we don't like that as children. You know, we none of us ever like it. You know, you, you clean your room. Uh, but you be obedient. You listen to me. Why? Well, because I'm the parent. I understand that. But we look at that and we, our obedience sometimes must be 
prompted because you see God, when we look at what they people were doing here, and they weren't being obedient to God, they were just turning away from Him, they weren't listening to Him, and they were getting themselves in trouble. Well, that's the way we do. When we're not obedient because sometimes God says do this, and we say, but no, wait a minute, I can't do that. Others can, but not me. I don't want to go the extra mile, Lord. I'm comfortable in I'm comfortable right in my zone here with you. I'm in the zone, and man, I am comfortable here. But our obedience must be prompted sometimes. Sometimes God has to kind of get on to us, doesn't he? He really does. You know, we're serving a God of love, a God who cares about us, just like parents care about their children. And how that that they want us to be obedient to them because, because, get this. They're not mean mom and dads. It's because they love us. Wow. You ever get a, I, I share with them, a pet, you, know, you ever heard anybody say, it's, you know, when, when a child gets a spanking, it's going to hurt me worse, it's going to hurt you? Well, obviously, the pain is there, doesn't That's back there. But the pain in their heart is. The pain in their heart. Because they have to punish their children. Well, that's the way it is with God sometimes. It kind of breaks his heart when he has to kind of get on to us and say, you're not where you need to be. So we must, first of all, then, render our service. Will we render our service to others? And he said, this is your decision here. Will you help others? Will you, will you render service to the Lord by rendering service to others? And the second thing is, look at verse 16 again. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. The second thing is, second area that he was trying to show them and show us is, will you reverence God? These folks had not been reverencing God. They had not been putting him in awe. They had not been recognizing God as who he is. Because they, he told them, he said that, that, you know, you've spoken against me and, and it's useless to serve me. He says, so they were not reverencing God. Well, he asked us, do we reverence God? The Bible says, thou shalt not have no other gods before us, before him. And a lot of times we do that. But will you reverence God? Will you recognize who God, will you recognize the fact as, as, as you hear me say time and time again, it was not the alarm clock that went off this morning that, uh, that caused you to awaken to a new day. But it was God himself that's waking you and saying it's time to get up. We reverence God. <laughs> Three simple rules of reverencing God. First of all, we must learn to, if we're going to reverence him, we must learn to realize, excuse me, to rely, rely, rely on the grace of God. Rely on His grace, recognizing the fact that we're saved by grace through faith and know nothing else. Nothing we can add to it or take away from it. So we have to rely and rely, rely on the grace of God because our grace is not sufficient for salvation, but His grace is. We rely on that. We rely on, on, on His wonderful, marvelous grace. We, we also recognize the, the greatness of God. How great God really is. He's awesome. He's awesome. You know, he put, Jeanette and I were, the other day we were coming from Greenup and we happened to look up and on Friday I guess it was, we, we looked down and we saw, on you know, even in the middle of the day, the moon was out. I don't know if you saw that or not. But the moon was out. But wow, the moon's out, the sun's out. And God just got it all under control, hasn't he? You know, you look out at night, you see the stars in the heavens, guess where they came from? God just took care of them. But we recognize the greatness of God. And then, not only that, but we also have to uh, rejoice in the goodness of God. I was listening to a sermon this morning, and uh, the fellow was talking about praising God and how that that. The, they were in the battle, and God's people were in the battle, and, and they sent out, God said, I'll, I'll, I'll fight the battle for you, just give me the praise team, just give me the, the, the praise team that goes before us, and he said, put the singers in front, and they, as they'll begin to sing praises to God, even going into battle, and I've all, I thought about that, I said, wow, isn't that the way it is, when we think and recognize about the greatness of God and the goodness of God, that it's easy for us to come behind and praise God after something wonderful has happened. But you know what we ought to do? We ought to start praising Him before things even happen because God's got it under control. 
We need to praise Him every day before the things even happen that's going to be good for us. So we see His goodness. Rejoice in His goodness because God has been so good to you. In the third area that Malachi is speaking about here, look at verse 17. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels. And I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. I thought about that. Wow. They shall be mine on the day that I make them my jewels. I think that when we look at that, let me ask you, will you be, will you be rewarded by God? He says, and told him here, he said, I'll make them mine on, on the day that I make them my jewels. They'll be mine. They're rewarded. He's rewarding them. You know, throughout all scripture, God has rewarded his people, hasn't he? And you want throughout your life, God has rewarded you. And I, and I know that people say a lot of times, my, my only reward I want is to, is, to, is to get to heaven. That's going to be my reward. Let me tell you what. When I came to know Jesus Christ as my Savior, heaven became my home. But I also want you to know, that one day there'll be rewards handed out. Okay? There'll be rewards that he tells us. There's that crown of righteousness and all these things. And he said, listen, it's there. I'll reward you for that. But you know what? The greatest thing is to hear him be able to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And get that key word, servant. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I think that, so you ask yourself, well, if, if God today would just say to you, I'm going to reward you for what you have done. How would you stand? Would he be pleased with you? That's what he's saying to them here. Would he be pleased with what you've done to give you a reward? Or would he have to reward you for your unfaithfulness and give you bad things? Wow. Hmm. I don't know about you. But I want to hear those words one day, don't you? Well done. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Will you be rewarded for what you've done? And then the fourth thing, chapter 4, verse 1. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. That will leave them neither root nor branch. I thought the fourth area that, that Malachi wants those people and us to see is will you be ready for judgment? Now I'm glad, first of all, that Jesus Christ took my judgment at Calvary of heaven or hell. Because when I gave him my life, there's not going to be any more judgment for me whether I'm going to heaven or hell or not, but I'm going to heaven. That's a promise he gave me. Because I've repented of my sins and I've confessed him, I believed on him, trusted him as my Lord and Savior, so I'm going to heaven. But let me ask you this. It goes back again when he says we'll stand at that beam of seat of Christ. We that are saved, will you be ready to stand there? Will you be excited when you stand there? And say, I can't wait, Lord. I just can't wait to get what you're going to give me here at this judgment seat. Because it's there our works will be made known to us. Whether it be good or whether it be bad. And we may think we're doing a lot of good things in this life. But if we're not serving the way God wants us to serve then sometimes they're going to be, there may be something that's not going to be pleasing to you that he's going to bring out to you and say, well, I can't reward you for this. Our works will be judged for what we've done. But then there's that judgment for the unsaved. This there's that judgment for the unsaved. He tells us in Revelation about that great white throne judgment for those that are unsaved that he'll have to say, depart from me, I don't even know you. You have to go into hell. Would, you, would a person be, could a person actually be ready for that? I hate to, hate to have that fall on my mind. Every day of knowing that, that if, I, if I die today and I don't know Jesus as my Savior, that there's that judgment that's going to cast me, that's going to tell me I'm going to have to go into hell eternally. Man, would you be ready for that? You ask them, will you be ready for that upcoming judgment? Will you be ready to, to face me?
I think that, he said, another area I want you to do is, will you always remember God's law? Will you remember and do God's word? Basically, is what he's saying. Will you do that? It's your decision, he said. It's time to make a decision whether you're, you're going to render service to others. It's time you make your decision whether you're going to reverence God or not. It's time you make a decision whether or not you want, you want to be rewarded the right way. It's time you make a decision of will I be ready for judgment and, and will I keep God's law? The Deuteronomy say, he said, I, God said, I've set before you this day life and good and blessing or blessing and cursing, life and death and blessing and cursing. He said, you know, if it's, if it's put before us today, today, very, this very moment, if God said, oh, I, I want you to make a decision here whether you want life or whether you want death. I don't know anybody in their right mind right now that says, oh, just go ahead and I'll take death. We all want to live, don't we? I mean, I want to go to heaven, but I want to live a long time here first until God is finished with me. And then, life and blessing. I love it when God just blesses and blesses and blesses, don't you? And your life just seems that you think when everything is going wrong, all of a sudden God just seems to, to give you a blessing. This past week, Jeanette and I ran into a couple of those precious people. 